Good morning, everyone, and welcome to GoForce Kimarn. My name is Frederick Polsta, and I'm the head of Hydropower in MultiConsult. And this webinar series, GoForce Kimarn, is a collaboration between Hydrosen and MultiConsult. And today we are pleased to have with us Geir Helge Kiplusen, who will present to us today with the topic of overtopping of Rockfields dams, with the subtitle uh, Understanding That Which Should Never Happen. And this will be the last uh, webinar before the summer vacation, and then we will be back again in September. And this uh, webinar will also be recorded. And I also ask you to write your questions to get again the presentation in the chat, and then we will go through them after the presentation. So I give it over to you then, Gerhelge. Thank you. OK, my presentation is up, hopefully. Yes. Yep, so I will today be talking a bit about what I've been doing over the last three years. Uh, doing a PhD on uh, overtopping and breaching of rock fuel dams. So uh, let me start very briefly, let's see. Like so, there we go. A bit about myself. Uh, most of you know me, probably, but uh, I don't think everyone knows me. I'm a civil engineer, uh, educated here at NTNU uh, some 24 years ago. Uh, I've been working for more than 20 years in Multiconsult. I've uh, been uh, yeah, working on hydropower planning and hydrology, hydraulics, dam safety, all sorts of stuff related to hydropower. But since June 2019, three years ago, I've been uh, here at NTNU doing a PhD. Uh, I'm part of uh, the Hydrosen Research Center, which I will tell a little bit about as well. Uh, this is a research center for yeah, hydropower in a quite broad sense. It's uh, very multidisciplinary. Uh, we have a whole bunch of partners. Uh, it's been uh, yeah, it's over an eight-year period since 2017. Now we're in the home stretch. Uh, we have uh, two two and a half years left. It's uh, yeah. 40 million euros uh, budget. So it's uh, pretty big for a bridging project. And uh, my PhD is a very, very small part of uh, this project. Here's a list of uh, some of the partners. Uh, uh, at present, I'm part of NTNU, uh, employed there, but I'm still keeping a connection to my old employer MultiConsult and the plan is going back there in uh, not too long time. But uh, yeah, most of the energy industry in Norway is basically in this uh, together. So, but why am I working on uh, breaching of rock fill dams? Well, this is a list of uh, big dams in Norway. Uh, we have a few uh, big uh, concrete dams, but most of them are rock fill dams. And the consequences if something bad happens is quite significant. And uh, understanding exactly what's going on is a good thing, we feel. So that's why I'm uh, working on uh, understanding the, those processes better. Uh, but I'm not the first one to uh, work on this. Uh, in this series, you can say we have three PhDs and a whole bunch of uh, master students in addition. Uh, I'd say they started with uh, the PLUF project, uh, where Priska Hille uh, took her PhD. She was looking at uh, basically 
how much discharge uh, a place drip wrap uh, can uh, withstand. Uh, her models used a fixed toe so that uh, the toe stone is uh, solidly placed. Uh, this continued uh, with uh, Ganesh Ravindra uh, when, uh, after that uh, Priska Hiller had finished. He continued on some of the work that uh, Priska was doing uh, using her sa the same model, but uh, introducing a, a friction toe, so to say, that you don't have a solid toe support, but it's, the toe stone is just standing on friction against the uh, rock or ground below. And that that alters the overtopping capacity quite a bit. Uh, and then he continued looking at uh, uh, half a dam, looking at uh, through flow conditions and uh, especially how uh, various draining toe structures affect the through flow and breaching. And then I came along. Uh, overlapping a bit with uh, Ganesh. Uh, so I also continued a bit on uh, the through flow thing. Uh, we wrote a paper together on that. Uh, but then I continued working on uh, a new model and uh, focusing more on the breach progression uh, than uh, previous uh, models had done. In Ganesh's model, there was a fixed metal core. So uh, as soon as the breach had initiated, the test was basically over. So what have I been doing? Uh, there's there's more than just uh, the sciencey bits of uh, doing a PhD. I've uh, been taking classes. Uh, not all of it terribly useful, but uh, that's how it is. Uh, there's quite a bit of time uh, involved in planning lab works and planning uh, construction of models and things like that. And we have to build the models because we had to extend the platform that the model was on and uh, had to build a ramp, a sloping ramp down from the platform and things like that. So there's there's a lot of preparatory work as well. Uh, in 2020, uh, we started up with uh, model tests. We had uh, one master student uh, in the spring semester. Uh, his work was uh, severely amputated because uh, most of that semester we were in lockdown. He had just finished preparing materials for our model when uh, the first lockdown happened, and he didn't get back in until the end of May. So uh, it was uh, amputated, but that's that's what's happening. And uh, there was also one student in the fall semester, uh, one who was uh, half year uh, offset, so to say. And then uh, the first paper was also submitted in uh, 2020. And it was uh, published in 21. In 2021, uh, I've been uh, doing more model tests. Uh, had one master student in the spring semester then as well. Uh, I also did some model tests in the fall. Uh, had uh, three different students uh, hired to, to help me do the work. Uh, and by then I also started uh, properly analyzing data and. Uh, starting work on uh, more papers. And this year I've been uh, working on papers, uh, but also since we haven't really been able to travel anywhere for a couple of years, uh, I haven't gone to any conferences at all, which was uh, something I had really looked forward to before beginning on a PhD, but uh, yeah. Now, uh, now we're allowed out again, and uh, so I was at the iCold Congress in Marseille last week. That was very interesting. Uh, 
uh, a lot of interesting presentations there. Especially the session on uh, incidents was uh, very interesting. Uh, but uh, I will also be going to Granada, the IAHR Congress. Uh, in, uh, yeah, I'll be going there in just over a week, next Saturday. So that's another that's another week, uh, and there I'll be presenting another paper I've written on uh, methodology, basically methods. I'll I'll be showing you later on in this presentation, and some uh, further publications. Perhaps we'll see what what we can do. And there's a thesis to be written. Uh, so yeah, in the fall, that's the plan. Uh, there'll be a defense at some point, uh, but yeah, that's at least three months after submitting the thesis. So that's very late this year or possibly early next year. We'll see. Uh, a bit about who's been involved here. Uh, my supervisor is Fiola Gudrun Sigtrusdottir. Uh, she's uh, just been promoted to full professor. So that's uh, very good news. Uh, I have Leif Lia, whom uh, very many of you know as a co-supervisor. I have a couple of co-authors who are or have been working here. It's Ganesh Ravindra and Marius Möller Rockstar. I've had a bunch of master students working for me, five in total. So, uh, or yeah, I've had more working for me just for paid work, so to say, but these have all taken their uh, thesis on uh, on my models. A bit about my models. Uh, this is the first first model. Basically, it's a full dam profile. It's a one to ten scale model, so the dimensions and uh, the materials have all been scaled uh, that way. And um, so it's the material is basically emulating what what's seen in uh, proper rock fill dams. Uh, taken from uh, a database of uh, measured uh, gradation curves of uh, constructed rock fill dams in Norway. Uh, although there are some differences uh, in that my material has very little fines in it uh, because they don't want all these uh, fine particles in the circulation system in the lab. So that had to be washed out before. So that's uh, that's one uh, important difference. That means that the material is probably a bit more uh, permeable than uh, a real dam might be. <clears throat> uh, this setup we did, yeah, first three tests, uh, where testing materials and uh, setup done three tests uh, of that setup without a core and five tests with a core. The core is a flexible rubber membrane that's allowed to breach in a way in that it comes off the glass wall. Uh, the thinking here is that the glass wall is the center line of the breach and that we have a symmetric breach opening around, uh, around there that allows us to observe the breach not just from above but also from the side as we can see here uh, it's been tested on different discharges most on five liters per second but uh, some uh, higher discharges as well and then we've uh, done some tests uh, with a riprap on it basically precisely the same riprap and filter layers that uh, Priska started with and Ganesh continued with. So that we have a good basis for comparison between those earlier tests and see what 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 happens when we introduce more variables in the mix. For instance, the through flow and 
all these things. Uh, it's a lot of material. Uh, it's five and a half tons of material that basically we need to shovel manually and uh, yeah, use shovels and wheelbarrows, moving it back and forth for each test. Uh, for these riprap tests, we also have to sieve out the filter material after the test because that material gradation is also present in the rock fill mix. So uh, one one of these tests is basically two weeks of work, two people working in the lab, uh, clearing material, building the rock fill, placing the filter, placing the riprap rocks, and then uh, sorting out afterwards again. Uh, these have been tested in a bit different way than the unprotected dams, since these are tested stage-wise uh, until we uh, reach a failure. Uh, this is identical to the testing setup that Ganesh did with uh, his half-dam models. Uh, most of these reached at around 40 to 55 liters per second. Uh, one of them reached at 25 liters per second because uh, I hadn't been paying attention when they were building in the lab and I noticed afterwards that uh, we have a fiber cloth on the base that's uh, there to provide friction. Uh, but uh, in this case it had uh, gotten destroyed and uh, displaced and uh, basically the toe stones were just on bare metal and that reduces the friction quite a bit so it failed at a uh, much lower discharge than the rest. We've also done some tests uh, with a filter layer and a dumped riprap. Uh, we've used two different thicknesses of dumped riprap as well to see a bit what happens in these cases. And uh, we, we see some interesting results. In, for instance, in the thick riprap test, then we, in two out of three cases, had a partial failure. There is a sliding, but then uh, the breach stops because there's quite a lot of material that just displaces, but it doesn't expose the shell material and start the erosion process. And then we just continue doubling the flow uh, until it properly breaches. But in some cases, it just fails completely. Do some videos afterwards. This is the setup, the flume. There's a 25 meter flume we have in the lab. One meter wide, two meters deep. And we're placed uh, cameras are, uh, above and on the side of the model, and we have pressure sensors, and we have water level sensors and things like that as well to observe what's going on. So, for the fun bits, this is uh, a full dam bridge without any riprap, basically, an overtopping that happens. And the moment you, the water flow reaches the downstream end of the crest, then you start getting an uh, erosion process. And basically, it's just a gradual erosion happening, digging down, digging backwards towards the upstream uh, crest end. And it's, yeah, it's nice, nice and gradual. Uh, breaching process. Uh, side slopes, you can see they are quite steep. You get an undercutting basically, and then uh, almost vertical side slopes that uh, slump piece by piece. Uh, at this point, we'll, we also see some in influence from uh, the core material. Of course, that's uh, something that limits the usefulness of the model, but uh, it's also quite realistic for 
to a number of different setups. A flexible membrane core like this is something that's not terribly common, but uh, there are a number of dams with that. Uh, an asphalt core would behave somewhat similarly. Uh, a moraine core actually also in a way behaves similarly in that it has a higher resistance against erosion than uh, uh, rock fill. And you'll probably get an undercutting and uh, more sudden breach of the core. But we're not allowed to test any moraine cores in the lab, so that's for later, uh, if we can uh, gain access to another site where uh, we can use those kinds of materials. So what do I do with uh, all this material? Well, I take a lot of photos before and after to get a good overview of uh, the geometry. I use uh, basically the same techniques uh, as uh, with drone scannings, taking a lot of photos from uh, different angles, having some uh, known fixed markers in the, around the model, and then uh, building uh, detailed 3D models from that. Uh, what I've also done, which hasn't been done much uh, at all, is uh, I've made these dynamic 3D models. Uh, basically, I have video cameras placed around the model. From these, I've extracted images. Uh, in this case, I've extracted an image every five seconds, and these are synchronized so that it's five images or uh, seven in the last few tests. These are all at the same time. So from these images, I can build a 3D model as well. Because these models are less accurate than the detailed ones I take before and after, but comparisons show that they're surprisingly good considering the low number of uh, images. And e even with just two, cameras, uh, you get a good 3D model of the parts of the model that you can see from uh, those cameras. So basically, this is uh, a, a video generated from the dynamic 3D model. So we get a good impression of the breach opening, the dry parts of the breach. Uh, but of course, we can't see what's happening underwater with the, this method. That's uh, the water is too, uh, too filled with uh, sediments to, to be able to generate a 3D model of the bottom. For that, we used the video taken from the side and basically digitized the the breach bottom, uh, not every five seconds. I haven't done that, but I've digitized it every 30 seconds. That's uh, good enough for a comparison, I feel. So with these 3D models, we can do a lot of uh, fancy analysis stuff. Uh, this is just an example I'm not going to explain in detail, but uh, basically I'm preparing these for some journal papers showing yeah the breach evolution comparisons between the 3d model and the tracing i do from the side and things like that that's that's what we see over on this side so what happens when we place riprap's on a dam see if we can get the video to play. There we go. It's a somewhat different process. Uh, without the riprap, it's a quite a, a gradual process. Here, it's a sudden slide, and then everything comes really fast. Uh, seen from the side, uh, with some uh, colored arrows. I've been doing something called particle image velocimetry. 
Uh, it's basically a image processing method for looking at particles in uh, in a video and analyzing how they move. Here we can see. Let's see. Start. Well, that's annoying. It's worked every single time until now. That's uh, let me set the slideshow and restart it. See if we can get it to run. There we go. And this is basically what's happening. We see that slide and then uh, everything starts moving quite uh, quickly. And if you look especially here, look at the riprap rocks and the filter layer. Basically everything goes more or less at once. The riprap rocks start moving because the toe stone loses, loses out, so to say. Uh, the friction can't hold it back any longer, and then everything starts moving. Woof. And after that point, the breach progresses very, very quickly, because it takes a lot of discharge to, to breach it. Even if we don't have a proper toe support, it, it takes quite a bit. Uh, I haven't done any tests with toe support, because I know from previous tests that uh, Triska did that those are very, very solid. So uh, we didn't do that for these tests because we knew that wouldn't really give us much when it comes to the breach progression. Here's uh, another example of what we've done. Uh, this is the side view tracing. This is done by one of my students. This is a placed riprap test. It's a bit different from the no, dumped riprap test. I mean, this uh, this is a bit different from the placed riprap test, in that uh, we have um, basically the breach is starting more up here. Uh, we get a slide, and we get an exposure of the crest uh, on the downstream end of the crest and then uh, it starts progressing from there. And once the shell material is, is exposed you'll get a gradual erosion process going but this happens at around half the discharge from the placed riprap without a toe support. So what do we get from all of this then? Um, well, it tells us a lot about the initial breaching and uh, the whole erosion process. We can't really use this data directly because these tests are quite specific to the, the setup we have and the, the conditions we have. Uh, for instance, the erosion process is very much dependent on the reservoir volume. My reservoir volume in the in the flume is tiny, tiny, tiny compared to uh, many of the big rock fill dams. So the actual process will be different, but data from these models can be used in verification and for the calibration of both uh, empirical models and numerical models. So that's that's what we're hoping that it it will help improve the models, especially when it comes to these kinds of dams that, well, there's not really anyone else builds dams the way we do uh, with these uh, large riprap placed protections, both on the crest and the downstream side. On the upstream side, uh, everyone basically places riprap because it's a protection against wave action in the reservoir and things like that. But uh, 
on the downstream it's quite quite uncommon there are some dams built for uh, overflow uh, more like uh, a weir that can be overtopped those those will have rock ramps of this kind but uh, large rock fill dams not really so yeah it's not something uh, others have really done much work on at all because not many others are interested in it basically we have uh, well we from this series we understand better how how much the overflow capacity of the dam is when we have placed riprap on it especially if we have a placed riprap with a fixed solid toe support it can take a lot of overtopping and basically nothing happens as long as you have good filters and uh, drainage then nothing happens just with uh, the overflow until you overtop the dam a lot so we probably have a lot of uh, extra safety in uh, how much uh, our rock fill dams can uh, handle until something really bad happens and that of course is good news uh, of course there's always a discussion of what is enough safety and uh, how much do we pay for that safety but uh, uh, that's not something i'm going to go into today but these results can also be part of that discussion and but another lesson is that because of this increased overflow capacity a riprap protected dam will if 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 and when it breaches it will probably breach much more violently than uh, an unprotected dam because there will much be much more water in the reservoir the discharge will be higher so that the erosion process will go much quicker and uh, that's probably not something we have sufficiently uh, taken into account uh, for now but um, it's something to discuss as well how how do we account for such things because basically it's a situation that's not going to happen some of the rock fill dams we're talking about they have very very long crests they cannot i cannot really imagine in some cases that it's possible to have a flow big enough to actually breach it the, it's just not physically possible unless you have this uh, extra big discharge due to for instance a, a big landslide uh, or anything like that which can give an enormous uh, discharge in a short time but with a flood no not really so what's next well uh, there's always room to utilize new knowledge uh, we believe this research can be relevant both for the design of rock fill dams how you build and uh, calibrate numerical models for flow through dams and for the breach development uh, it can be interesting for uh, discussions around dam safety classification as an aside the nve guidelines for dam break calculations are up for revision uh, in the not too far future so hopefully some of these things will be useful for them as well So how do we take it onward here? Uh, we have a postdoc who's been working since uh, late last year, last year continuing if, until now, mostly with uh, Ganesh's work, uh, doing some additional tests and uh, publishing from uh, some of the material. His name is Theo Dessert. He started in, yeah, he started in October. So he's on uh, a two year postdoc. Uh, now he'll gradually start working more with my material as well because 
there's a lot of material that I won't have time to uh, analyze everything and uh, publish everything. But yeah, hopefully he can uh, do a lot of good work with it as well. Uh, we've also been discussing trying to get a few new large scale tests done to fill in some of the gaps uh, from the impact project that ran in the early 2000s when they did uh, a series of tests, breaching tests on uh, yeah, five, six meter high rock fill, earth fill dams uh, up in Korygen. So we'll see, uh, but that's, uh, that's not happening right away at least. Uh, there's not enough time left in the Hydrosend project to, to start anything like that, so it would be would be another project, another funding. So we'll see if anything happens there, but uh, hopefully it will uh, be taken further because there's limits to how far we can go with uh, this, this small model in the lab in the flume. Uh, there's some publications to be found. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of uh, uh, conference papers and such that I haven't uh, noted up here. Uh, there's some more papers to come from my side. And that is basically what I have. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Karelge. I have one question for me first, and then I see Siris Docs that also have a question. The first one for me, uh, what is the basis for these types of tests? Is it to learn the behavior of existing dams, or is this in thinking of the design of new dams? I suppose it's a bit of both, uh, but I think it's more important in a way for the existing dams. Understanding, what we have built dams, we have placed repraps on it, but we didn't really understand exactly how how it affected those constructions that we built. We understood that, yeah, we made them safer, but not not really how much safer. And for instance, there are uh, some design guidelines on uh, on the size of riprap rocks, for instance those sizes are actually uh, more applicable to dumped riprap rocks. Placed riprap rocks could probably have been smaller and still provide uh, adequate safety. So there's, there's, uh, there was a feeling that we've been doing things, but we haven't really been knowing exactly why we were doing it and what what's the consequence of doing it that way. OK, good, thank you. Then also we have a question from Siri here. Hi, Garelge, very interesting and clear presentation. I wonder if some of your results can be compared to the old field full scale tests in Rössoga. Also, I wonder if you have some reflections regarding the resulting downstream wave characteristics, depending on the quick breach from place reprep versus no downstream reprep. I will hopefully look a bit at uh, comparing with the uh, Korgan results. Uh, I haven't properly finished with that yet. Uh, one of my students, he did some work on it. Uh, but yeah, I haven't collected uh, my thoughts on that bit yet. So uh, it's hopefully still to come. Uh, we have some. Uh, some observations at least that uh, we feel are quite comparable and then we see some things are similar some things are different uh, we see for instance the precise composition of materials is very important here uh, when it comes to dam breach consequences it's something i had hoped to uh, do an exercise on but seeing uh, that uh, my funding is now ended, I'll probably have to skip it for now and uh, see if anyone else can uh, do something on it. Might be a good uh, student exercise as well. Uh, but first we need to 
get a better image of exactly how much faster is it and uh, probably with the help of uh, numerical models. Uh, we have been in discussions with a student to to get some quite advanced uh, numerical model done. Uh, we'll see if that uh, happens or not, but if if we can get that done, that that would be uh, very interesting. Uh, looking into these um, combined hydraulic and uh, geotechnical models. Uh, MPM uh, for those who know about it and SPH uh, in the hydraulic side of it. Uh, those can those are yeah, more point based methods in tracking how points of material move and how points points of water move and all, all together basically. Uh, that could be uh, something that uh, would help in the broader understanding of how these things uh, all come together. But yeah, it's there, there's still work to be done definitely until we understand all these things fully. Thank you. And also we have a question from Peter. So not enough data yet to come up with bre breaching equations? No, unfortunately not. I think my results are too limited in their scope to to be used for general equations, basically. Uh, especially the limitation in that I have next to no reservoir volume behind my dam. It's basically a very small intake dam. Uh, but in a larger reservoir, will keep the water level high for a longer period period of time and that means that the culmination discharge out will be higher and that will get higher velocities and quicker erosion in that case so there there's there's still gaps to be filled in there but there has been uh, work ongoing on numerical models since uh, Koirigen and uh, last time the um, dam breach calculation uh, guidelines were revised. So uh, I've been in contact with uh, HR Wallingford, the UK. They have been uh, continuing work on their models and seems that there's been some promising developments there. And uh, we'll, uh, I'll talk some more with them about uh, possibilities perhaps of uh, them uh, using more of what we have done, for instance, uh, on the riprap placement and uh, how those affect the, the breaching process. But I, I, I hope that uh, better numerical models will give us uh, a better understanding of the breach progression uh, for a broader range of parameters. Thank you. Then we also have a question here from Morten Skoglund. I think this will be the final one. This is two-phase flow. Have you discussed the phenomenon according to model laws? We have basically, this is a fruit model. Uh, Basically, we try to, yeah, the, the gravitational forces are, are scaled, but an erosion process like this doesn't scale quite properly. So there are definitely issues here with the uh, scaling. And that's another reason why we want to uh, combine with numerical models, basically. Because, yeah, with a physical model, we get some of the things very good, other parts of it not that good because basically we should have used a lighter material. Uh, we, we tried to find somewhat light uh, rock fill material, but we can't use plastic materials, for instance, that have been used for other types of erosion uh, model testing, where you basically use a plastic material as your sand. Uh, in order to better scale uh, the behavior of the material. But yeah, 
we can't do that with a rock fill like this. I can't make a plastic rock fill. So uh, that's another reason why uh, combining it with uh, numerical models is a good idea in my mind. Thank you. I think we reached the end of it then. Thank you for a good presentation. It's always yep. fun to see some good dam breaches. So thank you all for listening in, and then we will be back again with a webinar series in September. Yeah. So thank you all, and have a good day. Thank you, and just call if you have any questions.